I'm Shakobi, as y'all know. I am happy to be here to moderate this session. So since y'all have already introduced yourselves, and thank you for keeping us on time. Um, let's start first with uh, Bob's going to present first, I believe. Oh you're going to do slides? Or are you, you're doing slides, right? Are you, no, you're not doing, we're not doing slides today. No, no, I'm not. I am. Oh, no. I self-organized. No, 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 no. It's not supposed to be slides today. That's not what we talked about. Okay, so the plan was to give a five to seven minute overview of what your organization is doing as relates to climate change, climate justice, and climate equity. So Bob, you have the floor to, to go. Wow. Thanks, Jacob. This is great. It's great to be here. My name is Bob Musil. I'm the president of the Rachel Carson Council, which is a big title for a small group. Um, some of you may have heard of Rachel Carson. What you may not know about her is that she was not only concerned about DDT and wrote Silent Spring, she was an activist, she worked with environmental movements, she helped build it, in fact. She was highly political. She organized, campaigned, worked for Adlai Stevenson, John F. Kennedy, for the Kennedy administration. She was anti-corporate. She railed against corporate influence. Y'all can come to this side. So she understood that it was not just an accident that DDT was being sprayed all over the country. It was a market opportunity for corporations that had used it in World War II and wanted to have a war at home. She also cared about environmental justice. That means that her best friend, her literary agent, was also the literary agent for the first book of a then not too well-known Baptist preacher whose first book was Strive Toward Freedom, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And Rachel had also worked with biologists at Johns Hopkins who spoke out against eugenics, that wonderful mainstream science from the early 20th century that said we had to fix our genes. That is, improve the race. Get rid of people of color, mental defectives, and other problems. So Rachel Carson was not just a little old environmentalist. And we follow in that tradition and take her environmental ethic and move it to the present, and we work on climate justice. That means that also as an organization, I think, Jacoby, you're going to ask us, is this going to be grass tops or grass roots? We try to do the impossible of doing both things. We have offices in Washington. We talk to the people who wear ties. That's why I have one on, and silk dresses as well. Uh, and we lobby, we advocate, we educate nationally. We have a campus network of about 53 campuses. And that's why I tell Rachel Carson jokes too often. And then we work at the grassroots in two places in particular, in North Carolina, where we have a fabulous young organizer there, Elijah Brunson, who worked with some people in this room from the North Carolina Federal Justice Network, Naima, Elsie, Vaughn, and others. And same here in Maryland, where we're concerned about CAFOs and chicken shit. <laughs> That's right. Say it. Say it. No, say what it is. Say it. I urge you to take our materials downstairs so I don't have to explain it all. You'll see maps there that we did with GIS mapping and graduate students at the School of Public Health in North Carolina. Guess what they discovered? as we already know. All of the worst pollution, in fact, it comes together from pipelines, CAFOs, wood pellet production, and more, is in the densest areas of slavery for the CAFOs, Duplin, Sampson counties. It's also in the heaviest areas, most disproportionately poor, African American, Latino, and some Native American, in other counties, and problem that I see is that people don't actually know about this. Hard to believe, but you can drive all day long around North Carolina and have a grand old time uh, in your Tesla. I don't have one. <laughs> and you won't see this stuff. They hide it. They have laws. You can't take pictures. We have friends who have to fly over in private planes to show the dead hogs, the flooding, the disproportionate impacts on poor people. In, right in this country. Yeah. The problem then is how we are going to try to move that issue forward nationally. 
And one of the things I like about the conference already, Jacoby, is starting with city councils, counties, and moving on up. Mm -hmm. And folks in North Carolina, for example, are working at those levels. In Richmond County, one of the impacted counties where they're trying to make a bigger and better natural gas compressor. Coming into North Carolina, too. Yeah. And so there, there are signs of progress that we've been able to help and others working directly there to elect city council members uh, who will speak out on these issues. I want to, because we've got limited time, I want to segue pretty quickly to the Green New Deal. You have to talk too much about it. I'm going to do follow-up questions. So you can okay. just do your open, and I'll get to the Green New Deal and the follow-up questions when we do okay. the more moderated discussion. All right. The Green New Deal is a real deal. Suffice to say, it came about because of both grassroots and grass tops activity. How it will work out, the answer is up to me, you, and everyone in this room, and more importantly, the people we reach out to. So far, only 18% of the American public appeal like the framers of the Green New Deal. Part of the reason they attack Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the racism is aimed mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that she will be portrayed as one of those troublesome people who doesn't even know how to use a garbage disposal. And that is just sheer, classic, historic racism. Let's throw mud at her and let it stick yeah. to the Green New Deal, which would actually, if we could move on it, change what's happening at the ground and at the tops. Let's go on to the next folks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to move on to Tamara. No, no. Uh, so whichever one of y'all want to go. Legitimately up to you. Yeah, which one of y'all want to go first? Um, Next, I'll that's just, fine. I'll get out of the way. And so you're going to have seven minutes yep. for this part. The visuals. They help me keep time. No, you're good. No, let me, let me go, sit, let me go sure sit down. Let me Dr. get out of the way. Yeah, let me get out of the way. So my name's Tamara Tolzo Laughlin. That is the most complicated thing you need to know about me. Um, I wanted to put this picture up so you would see a black person in nature. You've seen it for yourself. <laughs> so there's a lot of information about me, but I'm not really going to spend my seven minutes there. These are some of the places where I do my work. The letters in green are what I am doing to those missions to make it work for people of color. Right? So when you see it, that's, you, we can talk about that. Um, Probably some in our discussion. This is my latest job. I'm the North America Director for 350.org. And what I am doing there is making sure that the work is multiracial, multigenerational, and gender conscious, right? So as long while we build the mobilization, I have joked that what I'm looking for is a mass melanization. Mm. <laughs> I want to see people of every color in the street yeah. pushing and getting cover to the folks who make decisions around the work that we're trying to get done because we can put the brightest people on earth into those seats, but if we do not give them the bandwidth, the frequency, and the numbers that help them to make the arguments that are right, they get beat back by institutions that were built to slow everything down. Yeah. So I just wanna say that that is the work that we have to do together. And if you're interested in talking about the mass melanization, we should talk about what we're doing at 350 outside of this room. So these three concepts are really what we're talking about. There are youth who are in front of this, who are crafting it, who are shaping it, who are thinking about it. What I want to talk about are those of us who are their aging allies, the rest of us. Because, because it's not our job to be in the front, but there are other things that we can do. We can talk about why a Green New Deal meaning jobs means jobs where people are underemployed. Why infrastructure means all the stuff that's crumbling around us that we paid our taxes to get done, which is just not working, and including internet, water, um, any kind of system that you pay money to someone who you do not, who you never see, all of that is crumbling and can be addressed by thinking about what it means to decolonize and take fossil fuels out of the way we do our business. People, only people are going to do this. When we think about doing environmental work, I like to, um, to liken it to a party where you come back from a party, I'm about to give out my age by talking about, come back home from a party and you, see, you open up your box of Polaroids if you shake them. And, and he's like, wow, I have lots of really great photos. And guess what? I'm not in any of them. Because I had such a good time making sure everybody else was in the frame that I have nothing for myself. If you look at our bills, our structures, our regulations, our statutes, they all sort of have a hole in them that looks like people. So it's about putting people back into the conversation. So why do we have to do this? And why am I focused on the mass melanization? Because anybody in this room could have written these articles today. This work is way too white to be useful. It's out of alignment with where the future is going. 
because we have to do this together. And that involves investments today in people who are not in the work today. So why? All these people. Bob talked a little bit about it. This, these are the folks who started conservation work. We had to kill a whole lot of people and save one piece of grass. That's not the future of this work. Trash. <laughs> so what's missing from this conversation? Everybody here. I think we're about to have a really great conversation about why each of the ways we are showing up in this work are important for creating the melanization that we want to see and to fight this. Because this is what we're up against. Raise your hand if you disagree. OK, so it sounds like we're in agreement. Just want to back up. The other thing that's going on in the background is that we're up against all of this. This is the historical roadmap for how we got to a place where people who care about the land, who work the land, who live off of it, whose lives are attached to it, fail to be seen in this work. So it's not just whether people care. It's whether the law allows them and has restrained them year over year, decade over decade, generation over generation for really being a part of this discussion. So among the other things that we need to do, we need to start applying an equitable lens to how we do this work. We need to move people and resources to solve problems. And those people are the people who we've moved resources away from every moment until just now. So wanna just, I think we're probably going to get into a conversation around why it is we have to work against ourselves to do things we all need to get done. But it's because we have failed to agree that nobody should have to pay to get work done. That business cannot operate if it means sacrificing people. If you have to live in, if someone has to live in a sacrifice zone to get our work done, then we have failed to design work that is useful for all of us as a community. So there are a lot of things that we're probably gonna touch on, but I wanted to make sure that I at least hit the high notes while we start this introductive conversation around the idea that the Green New Deal sounds like a brand name for a rapper um, that you, who's, you don't have concert tickets to get into his show, right? You say the Green New Deal and people are like, that's not for me. Guess what? When you break down what the component parts are, jobs, infrastructure, and people, there's nobody who doesn't want it. In the state of Maryland, we worked on a Healthy Green Maryland Amendment for a constitutional amendment to put health and environment so that it could be protected in the future by putting it into our constitution. When we did a poll to get it done, we broke down what the component pieces are. They're the same ones as the Green New Deal. And you know what we got? 74% of Maryland, including Republicans, saying that they wanted to see this done. So what we need to do is push the label, because it's a thing we can unify under, but really take apart what it means for our communities. That way, we can get them in line for a conversation about the work that we have to do. Because it, we have to get ourselves in line. We have to get our needs in the space. That, that way, this concept does not get, I'm trying to use nice words, because I'm standing in the front. But, um, but essentially, what we have to do is make sure that we are clear on what we're here for, because if we're not, this work will get prostituted out in ways that allow it to continue to have the brand name on the top and fail to reach what we need to do. So I'm going to sit down so that we can continue having a conversation about this, but really excited to see where we're going to go. Thank you. And next, um, Alora, you want to come up or are you going to? I'll stay right here. Okay, cool. Gore, which is like some people's favorite thing to do. It's a great time, you know, all together in one court. 
Um, but I get to travel to different communities throughout the U.S. And I work with um, community leaders there, organizations, churches, and we put together smaller trainings where they're more personalized. So we're going to go to, um, where did we go last? We went to Beaver County, Pennsylvania, right outside of Pittsburgh. We did a smaller training with 40 people. We talked about their issues around ethane cracker plants. We talked about their issues around you no know, jobs there, so ethane cracker plants are, are popular. Food deserts, we went through it all. We spent a whole day training with them about these issues and getting them ready to go out to the community, as well as inviting local leaders in to have a platform and a space up to other community members who don't get to get the message because the media is bought out the community because they can't even write news articles about how bad ethane cracking is. Mm -hmm. um, they can't uh, get any support from the city and state government because the uh, Shell has bought them out too. So this is an opportunity for them. And I get to do fun things like that where I go to different communities and work with them one-on-one -on -one about their issues and make sure it's personalized to whatever's going on around them. So I think that's a little bit more fun because I like being more hands-on in community work, which is great. Um, I will admit to you all, I wasn't a huge fan of the Green New Deal when I first heard about it. Um, I was like, okay, what is this? Because I got the chance to be a part of some of the other things that were put through Congress with um, Senator Booker when he did the EJ bill. Sanders did something similar. White House had the 20 by 30. And I said, well, why is she getting all this attention when there's other members of Congress who've been trying to push environmental legislation for years and gotten no support, not just from the general public, but from their own you know, respective people who work next to them every day and fighting these battles. But once I read it, went through it, kind of got the, you know, understanding how people felt about it, um, you know, I was a fan. I realized that it does hit a lot of points. It, you know, it's always everything. No legislation is absolutely going to be perfect to solve any problem, no matter if it's environment or something different. I mean, you can't write one bill to make everything better again. It's just the truth. But it does have a lot of great points, um, has a lot of great things, and it's an opportunity for us and communities to take part and to write out you know, what we want to see in the future and support it and make sure that it gets implemented correctly. And it's also an opportunity, um, as Samara was saying, for people of color to really voice their opinion. Um, she's been doing this work uh, longer than I have. I'm somewhat new to the space, but um, I've been doing it since college, so it's 2008, but I think you've probably been at it a little longer than me. A couple decades. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure a number of you all know than me. But it's people, it's people like her, um, my mentor, Dr. Hollis, Ms. Bernice, um, people who you'll hear later on who saw me in college, plucked me out and said, you really want to do environmental work? And I said, sure, I'm really interested in this. I love Discovery Channel. I love being you know, outside with my grandpa. I mean, that's what I got into it. I spent all day outside with my grandpa when I was young. And then I got into environmental issues. And I said, you know, I don't, if I couldn't spend all day outside with my grandpa, like I would just, it would just be the worst for me. Because I know some other kid wants to spend all, outside all day with their grandpa and has to have an outside to actually go to, mm -hmm. to spend time in. And so people like them who would pluck young black kids out of obscurity like me and push them forward are, you know, important to the movement. And so I try to do the same thing, but um, like I said, the Green Deal is an opportunity for us to pluck more people out and say, hey, this is an opportunity to frame what we're going to do next how we're going to do it, give your input, say what you need, what you don't need, and so we can't really fudge up on this opportunity to move forward with it. Okay, I think that's it. <laughs> cool, thank you. Let's thank the panelists. So, um, what I want to do now for the next, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so is just to lead them through a moderate discussion. And we, so we're talking about the, this, you know, the, the Green New Deal. I was also a skeptic. So I want to know how it, the mechanics of it, how it works. So can y'all speak to how it's actually going to work? Because Laura just said, we've had other bills. I mean, the EJ bill was dead on arrival, partially because the person who they thought was going to win didn't win. So to me, it was a second, like, we got to get this bill out. So it was just like, let's go and get it out. But there have been other bills, too. So how is this going to be different? And how, and how is it going to be different? And what are the mechanics of it? So who wants to go first? And then and this, we're going to just go quick. We want to go to bounce, bounce. OK, go ahead. Okay. Which means it's a roadmap of ideas, some things people want to do. But the under what's happening underneath it is a lot of thinking. Democratic Socialists of America, a bunch of other groups have spent decades trying to figure out what it would mean to place the problems that we have under a framework. So it bubbled up with a lot of folks who were thinking about it. And 
its current iteration as a resolution is a springboard for other things that will come. Mm -hmm. And what it is going to do in the federal space is actualize all those things that we just talked about. The green job, the, green, the federal jobs bill, um, health actions, um, infrastructure, pieces that have long needed to get done. Really, it's an umbrella for a bunch of really great ideas, all of which were laid out in the resolution as things that we need to do. And there are some pretty significant local impacts. If you look at all of the media that's come with it, it focuses on what the hyper-local responses have to be, on what it means to put jobs, centers that are connected to a federal mandate that we are going to move forward in these areas. What does it mean? It means we have to start working in the councils that we're in, in the state houses that we're in, to look at, based on where we are in context, how we're going to respond to the federal mandate that comes from subsequent legislation. The environmental justice bill that came, I was grateful for it for a number of reasons. One, because I believe in the inside-outside game, and in order to protect the thing you have now, which is an incredibly fragile executive order, we have to do other things to strengthen it. And going for the kind of thing that has to get voted on, this is not an appropriate time to break our issues into single issues when they yeah. are, in fact, connected to other things. But I'll leave space for us. Go ahead, Bob. To jump in this. To, to Absolutely say. right. Uh, I just happens I have a copy of the Green New Deal resolution yeah. with me. Um, the points, very quickly, that I want to highlight, because when it popped up, publicly, everyone's like, what's that about? <laughs> Written into this is to achieve a fair and just transition to promote justice and equity by stopping current, preventing future, and repairing historic oppression of indigenous peoples, communities of color, migrant communities, deindustrialized communities, depopulated rural communities, poor low-income workers, women, the elders, the unhoused, people with disabilities, and youth, frontline and vulnerable communities. Mm -hmm. That is what it is about. That's what's important because it addresses economic and historic inequalities as well as environmental exposures and inequalities. And this, I should add, is a tremendous victory. It happens, but I want you to be aware that not everyone loves this stuff. I was at a meeting recently. I was with my old friend. You know, we have an old white guy's caucus. I was called, in, called, in, I was called so, of America. <laughs> called America. <laughs> stupid. You stupid. They actually kicked me out when I refused orders to Vietnam, but I digress. Uh, I was talking to Senator Ed Markey, and it was a leader of another important environmental group, and we got in an argument about the Green New Deal, this person was saying, it is too much, it will turn people off. All this economic stuff, all this, my people, I don't want to guess who her people are, <laughs> we should stick to just climate. This is within an environmental See, meeting, okay? And so we have to work, and part of what the Rachel Carson Council does, I'm a bit of a missionary to white people and others, <laughs> saying, look, this is really what it's about. You help cause this, we're involved with this, and there are people already working in the meeting, and you're going to help. And if yes, not, sir. it's a big, hot mess. A couple of things on the inside-outside game. Totally agree. Um, what's going to happen, this is passed. You understand that the Senate is run by Mitch McConnell and the Republicans in answer to Donald Trump. Nothing will happen there, despite Senator Whitehouse, Senator Booker, I want to congratulate his staff for being here. You know that Corey has walked around eastern North Carolina, looked at the CAFOs, talked to people there. It's the real deal. But what needs to happen is take back that Senate and elect a just transition and <laughs> oppress people's friendly president to make things happen. And while that's going on, there will be separate pieces of legislation that have to make their way through the same old committees that are stacked in the same old ways. It will be tough, it will be difficult, and that's why 350.org and others raise the temperature. I sort of go back and forth, a little interlocutor between the outside and the inside, and I gotta be able to say, as I did when people were taking over buildings on campuses, they look very angry out there. Maybe we could, make a deal here and pass some real life legislation. So my hope is that you will understand what's going on with all of this. Sign up with 350.org, Rachel Carson Council, uh, the Climate Reality Project. These are the organizations that make things happen. If you're just yourself looking at an MSNBC or looking at your phone, you're just going to get frustrated and burn out and give up. So join with us and the Green New Deal is a real victory. 
I'll, I'll conclude on this because I mentioned Ed Markey. It happens that before any of you were born, Ed Markey and I co-chaired just the lobby day part of 5,000 people in Washington lobbying for what used to be called the nuclear freeze. It grew up out of the grassroots, it moved to Washington, and ultimately, we didn't win, these struggles go on forever, but we did mm -hmm. hold back horrible missiles, MXs, reduce the number of nuclear weapons. That rallying cry, that simple idea, freeze it, mm -hmm. is what helped create the momentum. Same with the Green New Deal. There are people old enough, not me, to remember Asian, the actual... Aging allies. To remember the actual, <laughs> green, the actual New Deal? Yeah. Uh, and so, go forth and start talking about how good it is, because they're already going to say it costs $10 trillion, it's total bullshit, they being Trump and his tweeters. So it's it's millions. That's the Green New Deal in a nutshell, sort of. No, thank you for that. Laura, you want to jump in on that? Um, sure. Um, and I guess my thought is it's a good opportunity. They want, they have several groups like 350 and O'Sierra Club, Tommy Fields few others that are jumping on the bandwagon as well. They're touring around the U.S. and they want to get people's opinions on how this is going to work and how it should work. There's a lot of times when legislation has been put forth, they don't take everyone's opinion. They only want a few people, okay, what did you think? I know even with, um, I'm going to put Booker's people out there because they were good about reaching out to us. Um, another senator whose name is not coming to mind, they wanted to write a bill and they only asked Sierra Club what they thought. You have Sierra Club. There are thousands of other environmental organizations from, you know, local all the way up to the top that could have gave you your opinion. And you only asked Sierra Club. The mm -hmm. bill didn't go anywhere and they were like, well, we tried. It's an opportunity for us to give input and to say what we like to see and how we like to see it done. And uh, it's also just an opportunity that I like the gentleman here pointed out. They tried to address, you know, as many different communities as they could, from lower income to migrant to, um, you know, labor unions. All of us are in this together. And the bill, of course, is not perfect, like I said, but it wants to help everybody. And also, I think it's an opportunity as well that the bill points out that we already have to talk about, um, we have to take care of already environmental justice communities. You can't fight climate justice without talking about environmental justice. That's you can't sit here and say you want to do right. things better for climate and then you forget about what's happening in North Carolina yeah. mm -hmm. and Texas and Louisiana. Louisiana. Yes, they need climate resolutions and stuff like that, but you can't ignore that they're being poisoned by everything that's happening around them. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of bills ignore that. They sit here and say, well, we're going to put solar panels up, we're going to put wind turbines. Yeah, it's great, but what are you going to do with the folk who are already drinking dirty water? I mean, there's nothing to right. help them where you can jump on and do other things for other people. So I appreciate the bill for doing that. And I think it's an opportunity as well because it's receiving such traction from different outlets and it's being highlighted. And it's something that's, you know, hopefully doesn't die on arrival, but the fact that the news is covering, the papers are giving it a shot, so it's actually being outsourced the right ways versus, um, you know, some of the other bills that just run around. Um, that run around Dirksen all day and no one ever hears about them. So, <laughs> really true. There's a lot of bills that are within Dirksen, Hart, you never hear about it. The only reason I've heard is I actually worked on the Hill and did lobbying. But if I never worked on the Hill and I worked for a local organization like um, Empower DC, I never heard about any, any of it. Never heard a thing about it. And the only reason I heard about it in the Dirksen is because I had mentors like Dr. Hollis, people like Tamara, other people who said, did you hear about this? What do you think? Are you going to get input on it? So at the end of the day, it's a good opportunity for us to jump on. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I want to chime in on a couple points y'all made. So the populations that they focus on are really important. So, and the, it's the, the, the theme I want y'all to dig into a little bit more is this theme of equity. So in your last comment, you just talked about energy equity, yep. right? And we're gonna have a, a, some sessions later on that also talk about energy equity, but that's a big part of this discussion. So can you talk about equity as it relates to the voices and also equity as it relates to the money, right? So there's some other equity issues too, but can you talk about the voices again? Dig into those voices again, and, and also the money. I mean, whoever wants to, let, 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 Bob, you jump in first. I wanted to jump in about rich people's climate change. <laughs> That's what you were just talking about. Solar panels and your, the, the nice little electric cars. Go ahead. You get your Tesla, et cetera. Yeah. The problem is, and I just wanted one more piece from the Green New Deal, the legislation that has passed a resolution. It's not binding on anybody. But it says it must be developed, must be developed, transparent and inclusive consultation with frontline and vulnerable communities, labor unions, worker cooperatives, civil society groups, et cetera. Because if they don't, down in North Carolina, here's how the rich people do it. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. One of our universities we work with is called Duke. Mm -hmm. Wonderful people there. Uh, but they also have experts. 
Mm -hmm. And there's also Duke Energy and all these other mm -hmm. so over in Egypt, What they want to do is solve climate change by capturing methane out of the hot shit. Yeah. And that will create electricity, which will then... Uh, what? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to speak too fast. They're going to create, bio, they're going to create biogas yeah. from this methane. Yeah. This, this, which, which is already a gas. Which will require a pipeline which will have to connect up to the proposed fracked gas pipeline. Right. Right. And that, you know, who's going to make money off that is the Duke Energies of yes. the world. And the cronies. And with the mass people who's living there, working there, people right here, they'll say, nobody ever asked me about that shit. So, 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 Bob, you talking about extension of environmental slavery. You already said that the slaves, if you look at the slave uh, population in North Carolina and look at where the hog farms are, you see a connection. So you're talking, this is extension of more environmental slavery. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. And the, the worst part, in my view, someone will claim a victory that we're cap capturing methane and the huge, stinking, horrible CAFOs will go on. And people will get their cheap pork so they can... And Bob, let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. Let me, no, 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 no. no you're, you're right on point. The environmental groups in North Carolina already made that victory, right? The, when was the bill passed, y'all? Back in 2000? 2007. 2007. Environmental groups in North Carolina said, oh, it'll be great if you capture this gas from these facilities and even talk to the communities who are impacted by those crap lagoons, right? So that, the, the environment was already done, and, and they're still doing it in North Carolina. So they're not for the people. It's not other people, by the people, and for the people in North Carolina. It's environmental groups with brands who are doing corporate environmentalism, that corporate industrial system, right? They, so they're paying pimps, too. Go ahead. I want to draw a line between hog farms and chicken farms, chicken, um, chicken houses that have gone from family farms to multi-billion dollar factories mm -hmm. that show up in your backyard in the same footprint with a million chickens that are now your neighbors. Yeah. Right? So let's talk about what happens in between there. We're mm -hmm. talking about, we're, I mean, we're in the footprint of the will of reader incinerator. Mm -hmm. Like that is, like there are really significant things that are already happening to communities. The compressor stations and well pads that move whatever is flowing through, whatever is in a pipeline. Yep. It's all in these places, whether we are talking about the, crank, the CP crane Pika plant, that was a coal victory that we all got to be super excited about. And it's going to very quietly become a natural, a natural gas, yeah. uh, like a platform yeah. for another level that connects us from Canada to West Virginia, mm -hmm. down to North Carolina, That's where right. we're just going to keep doing the wrong thing all day, every day. The reason that the Green New Deal talks about infrastructure is because it speaks to that. We have to talk about what's happening with roads and pipelines and uh, compressor stations and transmission lines and generation and all of those things have to be displaced in the context of Maryland where we are, where we are, University of Maryland. Uh, we have to think about the idea that investments are currently being made to cement for multiple generations mm -hmm. a world where we don't get to have this conversation about wind and solar mm -hmm. and renewables, offshore or onshore, yeah. because guess what? We are choosing right now yeah. to make those investments and to decide whose future matters and who doesn't, as mm -hmm. if there's some other planet that we're going to live on. Despite the rumors, I have not, I have not seen anybody, nor do I know anybody who has a ticket to settle. Space Force. So, <laughs> so I just wanted to point out that, like, the things that are spoken to in this bill around what we need to do in jobs and creating local job centers where people are consistently employed doing clean, renewable energy work is about a different kind of investment. And what we need to be thinking about is where are we making investments? Who are our proxy votes while we do that? How do they get their seats and where do they get their power? Are they being funded by us, the people, or by corporations, corporations. that can consistently give them more money for lunch than we can give them after a year of, of looking for funding? So I just think we have to think about the whole picture. Mm -hmm. and when we talk about the green part, not recognize that like these trees don't benefit anybody in particular. So no matter what you think about who climate belongs to, it is your work. If you live on land, if you drink water and you eat food, the Green New Deal is for you. Come on, if you are a person who needs help and lives in an environment, the Green New Deal is for you. If you are someone who enjoys having money and having a job, then the Green New Deal is for you because the investments that get made now and the jobs that happen in the future are either going to be green jobs or they're going to be dirty jobs that kill us all mm -hmm. and the planet. Yesterday I was at a, um, conversation, a group called the People of the Global Majority Summit. And it was about black people, brown people, black indigenous people of color in the environment, thinking together about what it means to be working in this space at this time. And we talked about what does it mean to recognize that unlike the dinosaurs, 
we know what's coming. Mm. And unlike the dinosaurs, we're not just the planet, we're the asteroid. The Green New Deal is the difference between the asteroid accelerating and blowing us up or us having to make some shifts. Mm -hmm. So I just think while we talk about, it's good to talk about the words that are in it, but it's really important for us to socialize the concepts and for everybody here to take back the piece of it that belongs to them. Mm -hmm. Because that is equity. Because then we all own it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So with, with that, with that part of the discussion, how do we make that happen? So my question is, there have been a lot of, for example, grassroots frontline, that's why it's in the resolution, who've been left out of the discussion. There have been more, I can remember the, um, what was the climate change bill, what, 2000 and, was it eight? Seven to eight? All this hype behind it. They didn't engage, they didn't engage any EJ folks that said, the bill was already written. Y'all got to jump on the bill. Yes. That's always what happens. Yes. Bills have been written, and then, all, then we're always jumping on the, on the last bit, which means they didn't really care about us. They just want to make sure they get a, the color, the culture in. You know, they want to make sure they get enough people of color on board at the end. But that happens a lot. So how do we break through that cycle? How do we really get to the policymakers of who, can, who can have that kind of influence? Because a lot of uh, the folks who, when they get voted in, the people don't have access to them. So that's, a, that's also an equity issue. So how do we do that? I'm not sure who wants to jump in on that. Do you want to start off? Yeah, I'll start with that. Um, that's really good because um, I've been blessed enough that I have, like I said, mentors and people who invite me to lobby, invite me to speak on different things and give my input. And there are a lot of people who have great things to say. Don't ever, don't ever get in the room. Emails never get read. Don't get called back. Right. And it sucks. Um, and even um, in some of the organizations I've worked for in the past, um, I've been the only black person there. I've been the only black person that's working on climate issues. So, you know, some, I have to figure out which role I want to play. And I think that what you were saying for helping people get to legislators and make their opinions heard, um, it's, it's a lot of responsibilities. It may fall a lot on people like myself and Tamara and others to pull people into these spaces and get their voices heard. Um, and love. <laughs> exactly, um, get their voices heard. Um, and, you know, we've got to honestly, I, I think that will probably be my thinking is that I need to be myself and others need to be vessels and people's voices heard. Um, I don't want to tell your story because you lived through it. Um, so I wouldn't do that. But we have to figure out um, as people who are already in these spaces, how to get people to fly them from wherever you're going to fly them to and bring them to DC, how to better um, get them ready to testify at public hearings and share their opinions, um, how to help them Walk over people's offices and make their voices heard. I mean, we've had to, it wasn't my finest moment, but we've had to go into some legislative buildings and say, you know, you said you're going to have a meeting with us. I don't want to meet with your staffer. I want to meet with you. You said you could do it. Don't lie. I'm recording you now because you lied, but you couldn't do it. And, you know, I had, well, I'll call, you, call security. I'll record them, but what you said, like, we, have a, we have a responsibility to reach back and bring people with us. And that's one thing I, I try to encourage in um, college campuses. Um, I went to Florida A&M. It's my heart. I love it there. I love everybody. And when I met with kids last year, I was like, well, are you guys lobbying around this issue? You know, you said you don't want um, – Rick Scott to do this, have y'all been up there? Well, we tried, and I was like, who's in charge of stuff? Like, what's going on? And so we had to, I organized from here in DC with the SGA and say, what are y'all doing? Get them, send them up there. You have an opportunity to speak, do it. So we kind of have to reach back and pull them into these spaces so that their voices are heard, just like people have done for me to comment on different legislation and things like that. They pulled me into the room, sometimes unwillingly, um, but you know, it was a good opportunity for me to be a part of that. So I'll pick up and say that I, I agree that it is our job to be amplifiers. But there is a thing that I think is also happening here. We have multiple levels of le legislation. We have council people. We have state legislators. We have federal legislators. They interact with each other in totally different ways. And they interact in committees that have different levels of power. We have the most power as people in this room at the level that's closest to where we are. Mm -hmm. because, and you don't have to have a degree or a lot of, a lot of advocacy yeah. experience to be able to walk in and say, this is where I live. You are the person who helps me figure out decisions where I live. And as a person whose police power means you have to care the most about my health and safety, we need to figure out some solutions together. The other thing that has to happen is, as those of us who have opportunity to sit at the table, figure out who else needs to be there. That's the difference between justice work and equity work. I'm, I always end up going here, you know, is that Go institutions ahead. do 
equity work and human beings do justice work. The two do not mix because institutions live for generations and make plans with investments, usually involving your dollars after you die. But guess what? Human beings do justice work to happen right now in context. And what we have to do as a person who has a power or a seat at a table is go, I might have um, experts view on a couple of different scenarios, but you should probably talk to someone in this initial moment who will be impacted directly by what happens. So while we're making room, we also have to recognize that if we don't take an educational stance, there's a panel today, policymakers don't go to policy school. There are people just like you who got up trying to do something right. And if they're a person of color, they didn't realize how much money it costs to do something right. So they ended up in a seat and they don't have infinite knowledge or perfect information. So the information we come in with about why I'm being hurt, why you benefit from listening to me because I will continue to vote for you is always on that agenda regardless of what you are talking about. So we have to show up and do our part, ask them to show up and do their part, or we need to show up at the ballot booth and get somebody else in there. Yes, ma'am. So I just think this, that there is work to go around and it is exhausting if you try to do all of it. But if you only try to do your part to the best of your ability, somebody else will pick up the work. I have just as many people who I care and appreciate who go up and sit in the office as a policymaker and decision maker as community members because my job is to figure out how we work together, mm -hmm. not to ask any of them to do the other people's jobs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, so, so this is the last comment on this, and I'm going to open it up to the audience. So go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I am. Two things in connected and Tamara earlier said, and I think rightly, that Bob has to do this as well. That's right. One of the things we have to watch out for, and I'll speak for generic white people, is, <laughs> oh, they have an EJ network. Oh, the black folks are doing it. We'll let them do it. Mm. I'm going to go get my Tesla. You have to demand, first of all, big groups have to pay for this. Mm. Right? Yes, sir. We bring, I'm, I'll show you my budget. We are small. Look at the sponsors of this conference, OK? Mm -hmm. We have helped bring people from North Carolina, community members, uh, EJ Network people. Mississippi, Alabama, and we don't North Carolina, budget, South Carolina. We have a tough shit, Bob. Yeah. You know, at least I got a few people I can talk yeah. to. So that's a very important step. I want to not disagree, but on the, the local level can be as difficult as the federal level. Mm -hmm. I don't want to dissuade sure. anyone from federal lobbying. And in good old North Carolina, for example, we have a report clear cut that's about wood pellets and environmental justice and they don't hold hearings, they don't tell you when they are, you have to demand to get in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easier to see a US senator than some of these people. So you have to, you gotta push your way in at any level. Yeah, you have to do level. the work. Yeah. And if you're gonna do the federal thing, we are having a lobby day in late October. You all are invited. We pay people to come and put them up. Otherwise, who can come to a lobby day? Exactly. Hmm, ask me about that one. So, I think the answer we also have, we're developing paid, we call them fellowship, but people to work on campus to do environmental justice projects and work with us with a little bit of money. Uh, that is, I think, the responsibility mm -hmm. of people who have sometimes slightly more access or funds. Uh, and that is absolutely essential. And just say, repeat it. And I'll, I don't want to badmouth any of my big, healthy environmental group allies, but they've got to step up. And some of them are doing EJ work, but more of them could spread some of the funds and some of the stuff around because it's also difficult to get grants, it's difficult to have the donors. So, yeah. yeah no. At 350, we call it being movement generous. Movement that's generous. For it. Because not everything has to have your name on it, not everything has to be the person that you hired to go everywhere and know everything. Perhaps what you should be doing is leveraging that person to help the folks who are in the room show up the way they need to show up so that they can not be thinking about who's picking up their kid or whether they have food because they spent all their money to get to one meeting yes, and have to figure out how they're going to get back to live in a world that is not working for them. So we have to think about concentric circles of responsibility. Everybody's got a piece of it. Yeah, folks, I mean, I, mean, I talk about, you know, corporate environmentalism. It's important to break that stuff down, right? I mean, the system is broken. I mean, you got folks who are making decisions for other folks who are, you know, you know, voicing issues and not having all the stakeholders at the table. I mean, and, I, and that has to change. You have the Green 2.0 report about the lack of diversity in the green groups. And the foundations. And the foundations. So you got a foundation industrial complex. Foundations, for, let me say this, y'all. This is part of the problem. People do what they know and what they're comfortable with. That's the bottom line. 
and what you do and know is not much beyond your group membership, this is what you get. We keep getting the same repeat, right? So that's what we're talking about. All those groups in the resolution, that's why they have to be at the table speaking for themselves. One of the principles of environmental justice, communities speak with their own voice. I don't speak for communities. I can talk a lot. I can say some good words. But my job is support, be behind the community. Right, so that's why, to me, that's probably the most important part of that resolution. Because what's been happening over the years is, folks have been speaking on behalf of communities, frontline communities, and not letting frontline communities speak for themselves. And that's why we are where we are. Okay, so what I want to do now, because uh, I started getting excited again, I'm, starting, I'm going to do preaching again, like I did at the beginning. I got part two, I got part two to it. No, let me stop. So, <laughs> Oh, you know what? You just leave me alone. So let's go with a couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to go with Maria first. Thank you. Yeah. I have to hustle for my oh, next session. Okay, cool. Go, go ahead, go ahead. All right. So what Bob was talking about, and this is what we're dealing with here, how you were just talking about people speaking for other people and being at the table in the big groups. So there's, um, in, in Delaware, in all, various states, they have renewables and classifications of renewables. Um, Gina and Donna, and, well, a lot of the folks, even the folks from North Carolina, are in what I like to call company towns in the EJ areas. Mm -hmm. Okay? What solar and wind is going to do if you classify certain other forms of renewables, which are not renewables, are going to destroy mm -hmm. the communities that I work with, you know, that are in these EJ communities. When we start calling, um, burning trash, burning. Composting, burning in order energy. Um, it, it's just going to, now you're creating a stream where, excuse me, the shit is going to be more valuable than the chicken or the pigs for mm. these companies. That's right. But that's always been true. The gas station, the bodega is more valuable than the gas pump and do it if you own a gas station. Mm. So right. we just have to recognize that that's a continuation of that story also. So it's it, like, how, how do we deal with that? I mean, do you, we have to reclassify renewables, or it's like, I want to make sure that's part of the conversation, because usually the folks that are, you know, pushing a lot of this have no clue that it's even classified. They said, you know, power renewables classified. Yeah, and, and that was part of the, the issue, and I'll let y'all respond to that. That was part of the issue a few years ago when we classified um, in the renewable performance standard, we classified in the RPS mm -hmm. uh, incinerators as renewable. Right, we're still there. Yeah, well, right. One thing I will say that the renewable portfolio standards is about ex expanding the amount of clean energy. Our main job and our continuing job is to clean that up. Because hydroelectric, where you're just saying water fell from here to there, is called clean. It's great to look at if it isn't full of tampons and poop. But guess yeah. what? It isn't necessarily clean unless you yes. do other things, unless yeah. it isn't also destroying other stuff. So that is an area where the most mighty politicians on earth can, they can pass a bill, but it's our job to say that thing that we used to think was good is no longer good. I sat in the Maryland General Assembly in 2018 and got shushed by the then speaker because I was told, because I said that that burning trash is not clean energy, just like we used to think that lead was a sweetener and put it in our tea until we realized it was poison. Mm. You know better, you do better. You cannot continue to say, but I thought it was a good idea. I was silenced. I was not allowed to speak after that because the answer I was given was that well, Obama said it was clean, and the okay. answer, and, and and that whole conversation was really about not adjusting the technology, which is the statutes and regulation, to new information. That's why our mandate has to be connected to science. That's why our work has to be connected to justice. Because as the needle moves, as we know more, these company towns sprung up around a very specific kind of information. But when we got new information yeah. that the business was killing people, we should have made adjustments. And that isn't just happening now. There's a book called When Smoke Ran Like Water by Deborah um, Davis, Davis mm -hmm. which is about what happens when we found out that zinc and smelting and specific operations in Pennsylvania on the Monongahela were poisoning the people that live there because every once in a while it turns into a fog that kills everybody that's outside. Mm -hmm. So I just think ultimately we have to come to a place where we can revisit the decisions we've made because it was clean yesterday, it's dirty tomorrow because we read more, we learned more, we studied more. So, so that I think that actually calls for us to tether our legislation to science, not to our old ideas. So let me jump in and take, take a few more questions. Yes, sir. Well, I'm just going to ask you for all the rest of the workshops. There is so much energy 
need so much expertise in this mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. that you should ask for questions and answers before the last thing. But we do, we're halfway out the door now. You know, we gotta go to the next class. Would you do that for the rest of the workshop? It depends on how they're set up. Some are set up differently. So well, I, I think you ought to start rethinking it because of the expertise. That yeah, no, I appreciate that. It depends on how the session's set up. Right. Isn't it time now for a Not yet. I'll get, I'll get y'all out of here. So let's go here. Yeah, uh, Sokovi, you mentioned something very important um, about. So, so stop, stop for a second. We're not transitioning, we shifted the time. So the next session is not starting until 11.45. So let everybody know, y'all can chill. <laughs> you don't have to rush out. We're not, I've already sent the text message out. I already adjusted the schedule. So it's next session, you can transition out at 11.45. Hopefully start by 11.50, so we're gonna catch up. But y'all are good. Yes, sir, go ahead. You, you mentioned foundation versus community centric. Yep. And um, you mentioned science, and we're here about health disparities as well. And I think that if you think about it, the whole reason why our healthcare system isn't working, and we've tried to we've tried to figure this out, and we have figured it out in a sense, it's because it's not patient centric. Mm -hmm. And so, the, I think that there is a very good value to creating a, a nexus between patient centric healthcare and EJ work in communities. And I think that that's not being done. Um, so I was uh, I, I was uh, 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 chairman of the um, Corey Improving Healthcare Systems panel, mm -hmm. and that panel had no EJ component to it at all. And I'm just saying that I think that there is a value to looking at that connectivity, and you can help help fix, fix both systems at the same time. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Just to be quick to get to other questions, uh, if doctors are able to say, "Hey, prescribe," uh, you got to go get outside of nature contact with nature, that's, that's helpful. But then doctors say, well, part of the reason why you may have this particular health issue is because you live in an area with a lot of environmental hazards. So maybe I should be engaged in efforts to help improve that. Right. You know, it's just not enough to say what the problem is, how to make sure everybody's engaged in the solution. Right. And, and, and report it. And report it. So, not, so that's not just what, you know, scientists doing that, but it's also with doctors doing that too. You know how doctors go door to door? Mm -hmm. Doctors need to get back to going door to door and going community to community, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's part of the change, bringing something that was old back and to new. Let these communities accept telehealth, where some doctor in uh, some big city is going to be looking at them. Yeah, that's not good. It needs to be someone who's local, who understands the community and cultural context. Let's take some more questions. I'm going to go to the back and come back to the front. Go, yes, sir, go ahead. My question is just, uh, in the Green New Deal, are there things in it that you think might do unintentional harm at all? Or are there areas that it doesn't go far enough or something is missing? Uh, if, if any of you have that to and do, and do some lightning responses so we can get a few more. I mean, we got, t I mean, we have another, because we adjusted the time. We have 17 minutes, so go ahead. Um, so don't take 17 minutes. No, don't take 17 minutes. No, no, not for this question, <laughs> just in the rest okay. of the session. Um, when reading the Green New Deal, I like a lot, but also I, it also leaves more questions than answers, and that's why it has to, we have to figure out what's implementation, what we're going to do. Um, one thing I noticed is when we talk about infrastructure and we're going to redo all these wonderful buildings and we're going to give people all this stuff and get solar and wind and things like that. Um, I live, you know, here in the D.C. area, and one thing that I noticed is that, um, as in most mentions, we have a problem with gentrification. They are pushing people out of their homes, making everything pretty and new for <coughs> people to come, and nobody can afford it. I mean, there are folks who work on the hill, you think, oh, they're making good money. They can't live, they can't even live on the hill. It's so expensive. And I worry that as we go through this process of we're redoing buildings, we're making new shopping centers, they're all friendly, you know, we're redoing houses and apartments, everyone's going to live this clean life. You have companies that'll come in, they may not be huge companies, but they may be, you know, small to large companies that'll come in and say, they're giving us small interest loans to, you know, redo these houses, we're getting we're getting state and government funding, new infrastructure. We're gonna have we're gonna we're gonna come up from this. We're gonna make some good money, you know, and we're gonna do the clean thing. And I do worry that as we get through this process that we're gonna see a lot of things where they're pushing people out, where they're making new housing that's beautiful and pretty and we're redoing stuff, but you're gonna see people taking advantage of that and pushing other people out. And now that you have a new building that's all environmentally sustainable, yes, it's low emissions, we're so happy, who can afford to live there? Especially the folks who need it the most. Um, you know, low income people who can't afford lights and gas, a lot of problems for them. Or I worry that a lot of the big energy companies take advantage of this as well. So I think that as we go through the plan, 
and we put it together. Um, there's definitely legislation put in place or clauses or whatever needs to be done. Um, the lawyers will get into the legal stuff more. Um, that we don't allow people to come into our communities, get these grants from the government or whoever to reduce stuff, but also push us out of our communities as they're making it pretty for somebody else. Because that's honestly what's happening in D.C. We get new condos everywhere you look, mm -hmm. but nobody can afford them. And folks mm -hmm. who need to have you know, better energy costs they can't live there, so they still live, they go live somewhere else where they're still paying high energy costs and still living in a, in a terrible place. So that's something that we need to really strive for to talk about as we get to the infrastructure conversation, um, you know, as the bill moves forward, um, wherever it's going to go next. Go ahead and jump in. So I would say that I think that there are gaps in how we're going to get there, but those gaps are intentional because I, I have to tell you, working in the federal and the state level, we need them both. We need the big anchor pieces to move through the federal government, but we need the state at every level to be responsive to it. And there are pretty focused plans at the state level. A whole bunch of states have really important ideas on what it means to close the gap on how people get to live places. None of them work if people don't show up and say they're for it, if they don't go to the community meeting, if they don't back the person who put their neck on the line to get it done. What I, so, what, so, we all, so putting aside that we all need to do it, I do think that there are focused plans at the state level. In the state of Maryland, there are four different bills that make up essentially what go into the Green New Deal. One's the Clean Energy Jobs Act with incineration, the Community Solar Bill, because that was a jobs bill, offshore wind bill, and a Healthy Green Maryland Amendment. Those things together add up to thinking about what the future looks like and who's able to build things and where they're able to build them, and if they're looking at health impacts as they go forward, whether or not communities themselves are allowed to invest in solar where they live and be participants, owners, and generators in the same space. Um, if we're talking about jobs and increasing the new renewable portfolio standard, if we look at the idea that it needs to be cleaned up but we're still ramping it up, it means it has to go somewhere. And there are tons of, there's an entire agency called the Maryland Energy Administration that recycles something like $55 million a year from the, from the, Regi, um, the Renewable um, Cap and Invest Program. That whole, all of that money is supposed to go back into helping the citizens of the state <coughs> use those dollars to invest in these products. So ultimately, yeah, I actually think that while we're looking for the federal government to do stuff, and I like it too, I assure you that there are people who are already working, people in this room at the state level who have gone further than where the resolution goes. And I expect that we should be looking for remedies on, at both ends because nobody wants somebody who's 1,000 miles away making decisions for them, 2,000 miles away making decisions mm -hmm. for them. So we have to wrestle with what we're going to do state by state and continue improving after, as we try these things. The whole idea of states being laboratories isn't just for marijuana. So I just, I just want to point out <laughs> okay. that like, okay. like, we have some agency here, and, we, okay. and I think that between the two, there's a reason why we have a system that is a federal system that has state-level levers. They both do different things. And what states can do to experiment, the federal government can do to adopt and make mandatory. So what we should be doing is figuring out how we're going to get that done and who we need to talk to and empower to make that happen. Because Duke is Dominion, is uh, Washington Gas, is mm -hmm. Con Ed. They all change the name, same That's name, same shame. word. Yes, ma'am. This is our opportunity to create a multi-level strategy to respond to this issue. Go, go ahead, Bob, then I'm going to go to the, the other question. question. Was, is there anything in the Green New Deal yeah, that's bad? I would say no. What's not there, it, it all depends on the definitions of sustainable and renewable. What is not mentioned is nuclear power, wood pellet production to create electricity for Europe. Um, they talk about CAFOs, but we've already talked about how that could be a shady deal. Messy. Um, I was telling you about the conversation with Ed Markey. I was trying to you know, hassle this fellow environmental leader. I said, if this doesn't go far enough, it doesn't even talk about nuclear disarmament. You and I work to get rid of nuclear weapons. They're unsustainable, they're dangerous, they're n blah, blah, blah. This person's <laughs> looking at it like that. So what you really need to follow, again, is the details. This will all turn into real legislation. That's when we have to deal with, take a quick example. It was not in the Green Deal. I live in Bethesda. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're fine. The headquarters of Enviva, that is the corporation that is manufacturing millions of tons of wood pellets by cutting down North Carolina and other Southeast forests to grind them up and send them to Europe so they can get credit for renewables under the Paris Peace, uh, mm. Paris, not the Peace Agreement. Uh, yeah, we got you. So, 
What that means is we have to worry about a new facility they're planning to build in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Talk about the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. you know, a giant plant for wood pellets in Mississippi. It's a pretty red state, among other things. So we need to have, as Tara has been saying, we have to work at the local, state, and federal level, and we have to be a movement that incorporates all of those things. People have to care about Mississippi. They have to go down there, as they did in the old days. Um, otherwise, we're up against in Beaver. I've been thinking about whether to chain myself to their doors and because they're like, don't, don't egg me on. No, go ahead and do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so, as an equitable strategy, you let's go. I would also say as an equitable strategy, if you are a seasoned human, if you are an aging ally, you should be thinking about how much jail time you're willing to do. So yeah. the young people who also have to cash these receipts don't have to spend time explaining to yeah. people why they need an expungement to do it. Right. Thank you. So go ahead, Naima. Okay, so I just want to put a plug in for the EJ Summit coming up third weekend in October. And I would really love it if we could have this conversation at that EJ Summit. Okay, so, so have this same in North Carolina. In North Carolina. Yeah. In North Carolina no, it's the North. It's the North Carolina. North Carolina. Okay, so yeah. So this is going to be. It's always the third weekend of October, at the Franklinton Center in Bricks, North Carolina. Okay, so let me go to uh, Chris Rapisad Naima. So I, you hear a lot periodically about, um, well, we're going to take up infrastructure. And, and before you keep continuing, Chris, lightning responses. We got we got more hands out there, so I need y'all to. Give me like 30 second responses. Go ahead, Chris. And I think you, you pick up on these things that, oh, they're going to do infrastructure finally. Um, so how do we, how does, how does the public figure out that they're going to do infrastructure, but it's missing structures to fix these, all the elements of the, uh, that are in the Green New Deal? And infrastructure is this sort of like, you know, it, it's good for the people kind of idea in some ways. Like it, it has that public cachet. So, Going forward, how do you win that message with the public? And how could you ever, would you ever be willing to say no to infrastructure bills if it doesn't have elements? Lightning response. I'm not sure that an infrastructure bill that wanted to do good work could avoid having these pieces in it. Because we could talk about roads, we could talk about electric, like there aren't any parts where if we look at the whole of what the Green New Deal is trying to accomplish, we would miss it. We might miss an opportunity to say that. Well, what I'm picking up is privatization. Oh, well, well, that's a Infrastructure is yeah. more in a blend 50. Government funding versus private is this idea that yep. we're going to get infrastructure funded by privatizing, you know? Mm -hmm. So how does the Green New Deal position itself as polar opposite and win that? So I think one thing it does is talks about who has to be in the conversation by flattening the discussion so that it isn't just a public-private partnership with unnamed human beings sprinkling goodness onto you every week and you're not sure why that happened. <laughs> like, the idea that we are outlining the specific communities, the just transition piece, you have been injured, you should be first in line for jobs, for a conversation around how you get moved from one place in the work to another place in the work, how you go from an economy that's focused on your destruction and oppression to one that empowers you to be able to afford the housing. When you talked about it, I thought, oh my gosh, the jobs piece actually speaks to that. Because well-paying, well-defined jobs that give you the ability to be sick and sleep and participate and work, that all goes to it because it's not just about the building. We probably need to, as this continues to get developed, focus on making sure that in talking about the people who have to be at the table, those people are outlined in the different steps of the work. That way it isn't just a notion and it gets carried all the way to the end. So I don't think of that as a whole. I think it's to be determined and we have to keep our eyes on it. I'm going to go over here and take this question. That's, yes, sir. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so I grew up during the time of segregation. And, um, and, and segregation now to me is what I see going on when, when I hear us talk about no input to me that's a controlled structured racism and and to me until we you know address that so what do you you know so up there uh, whoever on the panel uh, when are we going to factor in a controlled structured racism uh, in all of from the new green deal to whatever. So who wants to jump in on that? Well, I'll just say the, the, 
traditional environmental movement, which in organized groups may be 20, 30 million people in the country, predominantly white, predominantly aging, et cetera, as we discussed, needs to open up its definition so that they can't say, well, voting rights, that's, that's not mass incarceration. What does that have to do with the trees, man? Well, the truth is, none of this will happen if we continue an undemocratic, segregated system. And you're gonna to have to have some conversations to lay it out to people who are slower than some of you in this room and say, this is why it's important. And I, the other thing I wanna say, you know, how are you gonna find infrastructure? This big word. I've argued with senators, I've worked with candidates who've lost because they've done it wrong, but anyhow. I wanna put a plug in again for the organized groups on the what should we say, the leftward side of the environmental movement? The ones that are at this conference? Unless you are connected to one of those groups, you can't follow all of this stuff. You can't read enough newsletters, enough listservs, et cetera. We just posted an article uh, from American Progress as an example, American Prospect, on uh, labor and a Green New Deal. Suffice to say that labor has been involved with the old Blue-Green Alliance, yeah. with all the Apollo Project, yep. all sorts of things. And they want good jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So there are two parts to that. One, yeah. if one has moderate friends, remember I live in the burbs, oh, I'm independent, <laughs> I think for myself, labor unions? Are you talking about Jimmy Hoffa? <laughs> you gotta talk about that. And simultaneously, I think you have to talk about Sometimes there are problems with labor that see a particular bill that's gonna get jobs for steel workers that's on an infrastructure you don't want. And you're gonna to have to wrestle with it. But you can't follow all that and get involved unless you're part of an organized both movement and in my view, organizations and citizen lobbies of a progressive sort. So, I'll, so I'll, I'll just add that. I oh, no, let me, let me, let me I'm, I'm about to close, I'm getting ready to close this out. So go ahead and add, but 30. Yeah, Seconds. I, I would just say that I think none of these groups are a monolith. There are Nurses United. There are, there are doctors who are working against this stuff. There are organized, unionized environmental organizations. I just think we have to think of, it's why we need everybody to be looking at this work. Because for the folks who are not on board yet or haven't figured out how to transition their business model, there are tons of folks who are ready now who are ready yesterday. So I do think we need to really, um, focus on, on the solutions that can be built from what we have done and put our, roll our sleeves up when we get to a challenge. I think command and control is always a problem. As you pointed out, we cannot focus on part of why the um, 350's model is multiracial, multi-generational movement building is because we cannot do climate work if we're not doing racial justice and equity work. We cannot do our work if we're looking at the military industrial complex and how much it is a polluter and how the prospect of inevitable and undending war is also an assault on climate, on the air we breathe and the resources we have at a time when all of those things are constrained. So we have to look at all of these issues and I think for our part as environmentalists, we have at least started putting out the welcome mat that several of these organizations rolled up a long time ago saying that if we're not exactly as focused on voter suppression as we are focused on parts per million, we have failed to do our jobs. But part of that is because all the folks that used to just pay dues and not show up started coming to meetings and asking about it. <laughs> so, so it's time to show up and start asking about what you need from everybody you need. So thank you. We gotta show up, step up and show up. So Naima actually wanted to ask y'all to be at the, uh, the EJ Summit. She wants this session, she wants you three at the EJ Summit the third week in October. That's what you were asking, right, Naima? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, so, so y'all gonna... I'll be there so long as it isn't my cousin's birthday. Okay. Uh, October 8th. October 8th. Yeah, 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 October 